All right, good morning, everybody. Master Chief Rivers here. I got my boss, Mr. Winston, and then I have my deputy, uh, Jason Bush. Uh, they're back there. I got a lot of info here, so I'm gonna power through it. A lot of people say, hey, what's the product line do? I could have sat up here and just went over notes, but I, I kind of put this slide deck together for you all, so I'll go through it. If you have any questions, uh, without further ado, uh, next slide, please. So on the agenda today, I'll go over the organizational structure of SPL. We'll talk about management and field support, uh, TDY support updates, uh, DOA updates for uh, Oak Corners ordering. Uh, twice a year, I'm on the uh, annual logistics support uh, panel where we go over a brief for all the newly appointed uh, supply officers to make sure that uh, ordering overseas is, is done correctly so they're not coming back putting in OSCs uh, through uh, 1113. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, field support branch, timeline of responsibilities. I know Mr. Adam hit on it, but uh, I got slides, so we'll show you some there. I got CSA Alameda timelines, and then I'll put together an uh, organizational structure development chart so you can see what that looks like, and then uh, customer focused solutions uh, that we do in the product line. Next slide, please. So here's our board chart. Uh, we are aligned uh, and we kind of construct our business, uh, mission support business model for the uh, four cornerstones here. You can see product line management where you have Mr. Winston as the GS-14 at the top. Then we have a deputy GS-13, which is Mr. Bush. Uh, he works uh, cohesively with the shared services branch, which is Dahl 9 and the field contracting support there. Uh, we have total asset visibility. So I have Sierra Chief Pagan, who's our supply and inventory chief, and he puts together and computes all our data for utilization. So when we need to go to the drawing board to see what CSs are cooking out there and where it can be pulled from, this is where we get all that data from. Uh, he works in cohesion with the uh, with FinCEN, uh, uh, Chief Robinson, and then uh, Chief uh, Riviera Guzman, and then they're in the uh, total asset visibility branch here in yellow. Uh, we used to have Mr. Warnicke, who did a lot of our work with uh, life cycle uh, equipment there. I now have uh, Chief Ryan Sukoil, that uh, just came from Kodiak, Alaska. He, wor he works hand in hand with Silk, uh, Surface Infrastructure Logistics Center, then SFLC, so he is the advocate for folks that are underway, and then he can go downstairs and try to advocate to get funding for the cutters and then the x stage funding that we will get from program they do a hell of a job making sure that they can do what's necessary and right to make sure that all the assured dining facilities have the funding to purchase equipment and then plan depot maintenance for cutters going into the yards that's a big thing we are in contact with them, so when they go in the yards, they're swapping crews and making sure that a newly appointed FSO is not taking over a cutter that, where the deterioration of the ship is completely just, just driven down to the bottom. Uh, I'm the master chief in the configuration branch, then the uh, logistics coordinator, and so I work hand in hand with Senior Chief McPherson over there at DLA since he is our liaison, and then soon to be uh, Senior Chief Esther is in my uh, branch, and then when Sierra Chief McPherson is gone, uh, Sierra Chief Esther acts as the liaison, and then he also tries to get training uh, tailored for folks that don't have the money to, to come out here for training, so he works with the Navy Food Management Team to try to get them in small, like uh, big shop training, jack of the dust training, it's free, so we try to get them over there as, uh, as, as, as much as we can. This is the new entity over here that you heard Mr. Adams speak about. The field support team, uh, we got a Master Chief as a team lead. Uh, Master Chief Vernon Jordan will be taking over that team. He will be the representative for D11 and D14. Then we have uh, Senior Chief Mason Champlin, who will be the D13 and D17 representative. And we have uh, soon to be Senior, Senior Chief Crystal Wiggins. Uh, she will be taking over D1 and D5. We have uh, uh, Chief Michelle Seiko, the PAC Area Special Command Aide. She'll come in. It'll be great to have her on board as well, taking over D8 and D9. And then we have Chief Michael Franklin, who's on the Coastal Group Bear, uh, who'll be coming over for D7 and Pat for Schwab. Next slide, please. 
Here's a quadrant right here of the type of work that we do. Uh, mission support, business model, product line organization. I mentioned that there's six of us in the office at the Google Service Center. Uh, we do a lot of crosswork with Fenson at SFLC, uh, Silk, DLA. Uh, we talk to a uh, program every day, working on stuff to, mm -hmm. to make big changes for the rate. Uh, the big thing, total asset visibility here, we've been talking about reports. Uh, that's what we use, it's all audited. We take the data from there, we build it. Uh, Mr. Wordicky was huge here, building a uh, life cycle inventory for equipment. Chief uh, <coughs> Sukoil comes in, and he's able to kind of like run with that, so it's helped us uh, instrumentally. By level support, I told you, cross-functional work. Uh, we talk and communicate with these entities on a daily basis. Uh, TTP, a lot of folks should be surprised that they'll know it exists on the Coast Guard portal. So it's important that we push that because the type of aids, they're all there. Uh, low guys is one of those things. Uh, well, Mr. Wernick, he was there. We've given them to smaller assets and they work. It's hard to sit here and, and give a, a large cutter a low guy when they don't even load out correctly. So that's something that we're working on. Here in the top right uh, quadrant over here, product line information management. These are all the things that we see on a daily basis. Uh, looking at annual audits when they come in, deficits, deficit reporting, we track utilization. Uh, we use this for Coast Guard wide staffing analysis. Uh, cost modeling, uh, plan maintenance is important. Facilities configuration is important. I should be able to walk to base LAOV and then go to base Seattle. Everything should be the same with the exception of the experience from the food service officer you should have the same equipment there everything should be ran the same you're filling out the same 3123 and we go to some units and it's just not the case you go to some units and they're like i've never even heard of the 3123 what is the 2581 and i'm not making this up <laughs> so i just think as senior leaders we need to do a better job making sure that everybody's far aware of these things food service contract data analysis our analytical expert, Mr. Bush, uh, he's working with uh, the contract and dining facilities to make sure that the, uh, that the, the, the work in the spectrum is the same across the board, how they serve, the way they, how they clean, the way they track meals, so he's involved with that type of stuff. Down here in the left quadrant here, where we're, uh, we have our customer-focused-based solutions, uh, TTP, that's all standard stuff, and we, we work with a program and we try to get that stuff back into the schoolhouse when the things that are going wrong, uh, we'll, we'll give it to you blinds and say, hey, this is what we're seeing out in the field. What are you guys teaching here? Because this is what we're seeing out there in the field. Innovation, uh, asset visibility and resource management, kind of like what we need to do to help them do their jobs better. Uh, load planning, which is the configuration management, that's something that we're getting, where we're trying to uh, wrap a bow around that. Menu development, uh, this comes in handy when you have units in an excess deficit. So they're here and they will say, hey, let me look at your menus. You probably should be buying bulk meats and buying core items instead of trying to go out and buy 17 of this, 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 and that at the store every day. Uh, subsistence system of record, uh, we talked about that, Chief Toller, we talked about that, that's in the process. Pre-deployment support to cutters, uh, that area is very heavy on this. I'm not really heavy on the packed area side. So every time a major cutter gets underway, I'm in on the pre-deployment brief. So I need to get the pack 37 to see if they can try to get me involved in this. Uh, hurricane and contingency uh, culinary support. So Sierra Chief Pagan, uh, to this day, he would track. So he's tracking me in right now. So every day uh, we put together these briefs for the doll and the logistics centers, and it has, and you'll reach out to all the units in affected AOR, and it's basically saying how much food you have, how much water you have, what's your inventory, what's your contingency, am I able to go to the mom and pop store and take my food there because we may end up losing power in the event we don't have a generator show. He puts together a report, a report every morning, and then we get that up. Uh, AST, Technician Nutritional Analysis and Support, a couple years ago we went out there and we provided some like uh, uh, post and pre-post meals for them. They were deficient in their uh, caloric intake and we found out that a lot of them were like failing out of the courses because they weren't eating. Uh, they should be getting a lot. The food is a 
definitely a lot better here, so they should be eating. Uh, they were uh, afraid to eat, afraid to throw up, uh, osteoporosis, breaking bones, breaking ankles, and so it's just one of those things that now that they're out here, uh, hopefully they've been going better. Forty dollars a person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Over here on the right, uh, critical field staffing, that's just kind of like, I get about seven solicitations on average a day. So if we're short 153, that's almost like every cutter is short of CS. So between the AOs telling me, Senior Chief Wright, uh, Chief Toller, and the commands, and search, I'm hearing it from all over, and I'm doing what I can do to try to plus up to make sure that everybody can leave appear at 100 percent but it's just it's impossible right now uh tdyc time uh, i track all that stuff i can see the demands in the district and the area so if you're to ask me where should we put a csa i can tell you all that because i've been tracking it for almost six to seven years um csa yorktown uh they're the go-to so when a request comes in i'll uh, communicate with Massachusetts Cinelaw and then we try to turn it out within 24 to 48 hours so we don't have to send out a message post our why. And then the internal communications there, I talk to search staffing on a daily basis so it's, it's almost like there are only two rates in the Coast Guard to deal with search staffing, that's the CS and the HSs and we're both on the same floor at the Hidden Service Center. Hey Mass Chief, can, yes. you, can you tell everybody how, like, how much support Yorktown provides? I got you. I got you. Uh, we prioritize the support for a float. So if Station Grand Isle needs somebody that, that's down here, we prioritize it by a float. And uh, that, that's just what we do. A lot of folks want to send people out and they go on weddings, they go on leaves and stuff like this, but we have to prioritize it. And now new messages come out when we're getting to the point a couple years ago, I was saying, like, what's more important? Sending a CS on an FRC for a week? or sending somebody downrange on a 210 where they can actually provide support where they may not be able to fly out of the foreign port. So LAT uh, and Cutter Forces, uh, they've been looking at that type of stuff right now. Which mission is more important? Is the Eagle more important than the Wimsel? That's kind of like where we're starting to look at right now because they're different missions. Then culinary support activity uh, component is successful. We've tried it, we've tested it. Great things happen down there. Next slide, please. DLA ordering for Oconus, these are just some bullets right here. So for those of you that either been on two tens, going on major cutters, this is just what we see right now. Uh, large and medium of floats, you should be loading out with 70%. It's in the manual. I know the manual's outdated, but you should be loading out max 10 as possible, and it's not happening. And Chief Toller and Senior Chief Fuchs, they can attest to that. You should be leaving home port fully loaded. Uh, where you should only have to replenish your fresh fruits and vegetables, and we're seeing that that's not the case. They're taking off $30,000 of food. Hey, Master Chief, I couldn't have the whole duty section help me, and so now they're trying to do a full loadout somewhere where you're not gonna get the 100% fill. It's not gonna happen. Uh, what we encourage is try to get all your prime vendor stuff in port because when you go down range, the quality of stores is gonna be down here. You ask for chicken, you may not get chicken, so it's important to have all your stuff prior to leaving. Uh, contingency reserve, you've probably seen that service-wide exam. It's important to calculate that 25% because you just never know how many port calls you may miss while you're down in theater in your AOR. Then if you have a question, you contact us with any equipment or personnel issues. Uh, if, you, if you're using DLA equipment, uh, reach out to us and then Normally, I have somebody task for one of the cutters. Here, 29 days, make sure your count is active. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple, straightforward. Uh, making sure that you know your requested delivery dates, invoices, TVLS, time of delivery, all that stuff is important. And then it's important to download your catalog as part of the meeting. Next slide, please. <coughs> Surge staffing here. CSTDY report, so the request comes in at the district. If the district can handle it, they'll source it within the district. If not, if it comes to me, they elevate it to me, then I put the slate together for the field. This is what I look at to determine what my candidacy pool should be. So usually I go to CSA Yorktown first. The, the, the request is a third class. Hey, Massachusetts, Simulon, 
I need a third class. He says, hey, I'll have a name for you by the end of the day. Just like that, that's how soon it works. And then I'll go down the list. If he's exhausted, temporary disestablished units, uh, members in need, uh, they, they'll need seat time and they'll give me a call and say, hey, I need four years, I need four months seat time, Master Chief, so I can compete for the service plan. And I'll do what I, I have to do to make sure they get it. Uh, you got medics <coughs> in the NWR housing positions. I'll tell you what, it's hard to get those folks. It's hard to get them. It's hard to get them. Uh, and then the priority folks. Next slide, please. So here are TUI updates. So you see the meth quadrant over here. Uh, fiscal year 22, quarter four, there was 37 solicitations. And you see uh, your town had 12 and 32% uh, there. Uh, the basis took up uh, eight solicitations, sectors at 11, and then you had the, the smaller uh, cutters, uh, PSC in the yard, and uh, one there. So uh, you can see there, Yorktown for the quarter, roughly 32%. These are just the days over here in the top right quadrant for uh, fiscal year 22, quarter four. Uh, Yorktown, see me like 344 days. Uh, bottom left quadrant over here, I deal with uh, emergency contingency operations as well. Uh, so far, the 213 RRs that have come in from the INT from Sector QS, they were asking for uh, two CSs to help out at Sector QS. Uh, they have one helping <coughs> out, augment the TDY folks that have come down, and the other CS is on standby because we have like two or three uh, FRCs down there, which is one CS on board. And so then another request came in for the Isaac Bale, where we sent the CS down there to help them out so we wouldn't burn out the first class that was down there. Bottom right quadrant over here, uh, steady state operations. Uh, these are the requests for forces right now that have hit my board, and these are the two that are open, the Benjamin Daly and then the Tyvee. And then down here you see what your town, these are the upcoming solicitations that they're filling. Mayor Huey Kimball, Eagle, Tyvee, Ventures, and the Ford. So even though they're short or they haven't reached their full power, they're short five, and they're on the hook for seven here. So they're doing it out here in your town. Next slide, please. Quick interjection, CSA Yorktown is one of those even uh, not being fully staffed. They haven't been fully staffed because of the general shortage across the workforce of CSs that we're trying to try to Still making mission at CSA Yorktown. People are getting trained and they're putting people in their way. It's a big evolution, but it worked out great. And then uh, the, other, the other piece of this too is that, uh, you know, um, Master Chief's doing such a great job we got an email from the DMs asking them how they get visibility on how many DMs have gotten underway because we don't know in the DM workforce how many DMs are filling critical fields. They reached out because they had thought he was doing it for the DMs as well. So another shout out to CS exceeding everyone else and being looked at as the leader. So good. Next slide. Next slide, please. <coughs> So we talked about the field support branch. Uh, just, a, just a simple timeline of there. It was an off-season solicitation that came out. Uh, PCS, uh, e-resumes were due uh, for, for, that, for that specific job. Uh, one September, uh, Mr. Wernicke issued orders, and then, as Mr. Adams mentioned, somewhere between the April and July frame, we'll have folks uh, reporting on board. Those are the five billets that we're, we're getting there, so it is nice to be getting the Master Chief billet back as a, as a team lead, and then they'll all be uh, under the subsistence product line based out of Norfolk. Uh, they're basically just gonna provide the remote monitoring um, responsibilities here, we say technical assistance, uh, sharing your screen, mentorship, putting uh, training aids out there, and then roundups, we try to be heavily involved with that type of stuff, and then command visits uh, when it's funded. Uh, I had to go out to Air Station Clearwater, CLC, come on out here and help me get everything together. So a lot of times, commands, and Mr. Wernicke to attest to this, where's your annual audit, where's your annual audit? We haven't seen it in three months, and when they know it's a problem, they fork up the money for us to come out there and get it right. So uh, it's what we have to do. We're there, they'll be there to provide <laughs> assistance, uh, Oversight, uh, they're monitoring Coast Guard dive facility records, uh, help out with the budgeting planning, and then basically we're utilizing the reports that come in and generate uh, the data for us. TTP is very important there uh, for the inclusion, and then through uh, continuous improvement, 
it's important that we go out there and see what they're doing, take it, and then try to bring that back uh, to the schoolhouse for the human performance cycle to make sure that we're not repeating the process. And then more than likely, uh, it'll be uh, XPL at USCG.mil, and then it'll also be linked to Teams. So you talk about the word Teams, if you're not linked to Teams, that's what technology is, you might want to get on board with Teams because it, this is where we're able to share stuff across the board, and it's a powerful tool to use. Um, I'm just saying, a very, very powerful tool. With the, with the number of billets too, I know Mr. Adams mentioned it, um, there's five billets out there, he said six. Does anybody know where the sixth Why billet is, is going? I do. I know you do. <laughs> anybody else in the room? I do. Hunter, raise your hand. Yes. <laughs> so Vincent is getting, it will now have three liaisons there to help support uh, the paperwork mission of the lead. So, because they're doing a great job. They're, they've taken on way more than they, uh, we're ever designed to, so we need to get a third body there. And the good news is they're not, it's not a completely standalone. I think Hunter knows this. I know the folks that have worked at FinCEN for several years now. That team, the team at SPL, we work hand in hand. We're in the same basic area code, so we're tied together both electronically and physically by phone. So we do a lot of handing off of documents. They do the financial take a look and say, look, this community needs real, a lot of help. And then we sent somebody parachuting in from SPL to use including Eric and the team at headquarters as well. I mean, we've been, you know, everybody locked together. I mean, it seems like not that we do a lot of behind the scenes work that people don't see. It's just uh, it's the unglorious side of the house. The side. Okay, uh, yeah, great. Uh, next slide, please. CSA, Alameda decision assignment year. Uh, that's what we all been kind of waiting for. Finally getting, you know, we get it right. Uh, a big group of CSs here in one location away from the training center in Alameda uh, where all the cutters are. So uh, official shopping list published. Uh, deadline will be in November. Uh, both Mr. Wernicke and Senior Chief Wright will uh, develop slates and eventually issue orders. And then uh, the develop, you know, get them in by January, March. Uh, decision timeline, uh, report dates will be July, September. Uh, we'll usually, like so you say, Yorktown will be a scissor cutting ceremony, which will be a grand opening uh, September to October. Uh, October, December, you'll see training opportunities, and that will be both on the culinary and admin side. We'll make sure that everybody there is well versed in cooking the way they should cook with a mass amount of folks, and then making sure that you're up to speed with FSMS credit card terminals, all that type of stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And in January 2024, they should be full uh, mission capable with the TDY full contingent. Over here uh, on the right, the staff will be 22 CSs. There'll be 12 CSs for steady state. And then there'll be 10 CSs that will be a deployable uh, TDY pool contingent. So uh, steady, steady staff will be con considered full mission capable no later than, no, no less than 70% staffing so even though you you're going to get 12 there uh, no less than 7% if they have nine of the 12 CS's for steady state then you're good to go uh, the deployable uh, kind of like CSA Yorktown there should be at a minimum like 80% of them deployed so if you have 10 in the deployable contingent eight can be out at a time and then you could have one or two that's in transitory unit or one coming back so they should be at least 80% out there as far as a central point of coordinating, that would be me or the master chief taking my spot when I leave. Uh, they'll be doing that, and then we basically just f it'll follow the CSA Yorktown model. Our operational focus, and I mentioned earlier, is, 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 a, is, is a float. And the way it will work is, as the fields will come up, I'll go land area, east coast, pack area, west coast. But just know that once Yorktown is exhausted, could still be at CSA Alameda and have to go east. So we'll, we'll fill up on the east coast first, and then that, that's that's how we weigh it out. Uh, the large dive facilities, when Yorktown is exhausted, that's usually who I go to the bases because they're plussed up. They usually provide about 25% support because they have the bandwidth to do it. That's where the assets are. You should be able to walk from the galley to the cutter. That's, that, that's a cutter home point. And then 
with these two together, we should bring the, the capability across the country to about 90% having these two, so uh, we're getting there. Next slide, please. This is just a simple uh, org chart, structure development on what CSA Alameda would look like. Uh, that master chief would be the uh, food service officer. You'd have two chiefs who are basically uh, shift supervisors, and you'll have uh, four first classes. You'll have a watch captain in each section, and then I have two over here in the TUI contingent pool. You have a JOD in each section, and then you have your two shifts here where I could do an extra third in the morning shift. It would be do a morning, lunch, and then you'd have a swing shift coming in. And then these folks over here, this is your uh, TUI pool contingent of 10. Next slide, please. And then uh, just customer staying operationally focused. Uh, I continue to work every day with search staffing so we can uh, identify candidates for the D7 uh, migrant interdiction operations. And that's basically uh, Operation Vigilant Century, OES. We're still in phase one. Uh, we're working with DAL 3 on the CS readiness tool. It was a pilot test where we took uh, the large bases and where all the slates were coming back is unavailable. I'm able to look at this and see now with granularity as to why your members can't get underway. So I need to know why they can't get underway. Do they have uh, shoulder surgery? Are they in training? Are they on leave? So now I'm able to look at this at these specific bases and say, hey, you have three people that are in green. They can get underway. So now I can call the FSO directly and say, who would you like to provide to the Eagle? It makes, it, it, it makes my life that much more simple. So. We have been beta testing it, and we finally came up with it. Uh, we're, in, we're still in the first month with it, and I, I think it's going well to help me fill the uh, critical fields. Uh, here, next to it, uh, Mr. Bush has done an excellent job here uh, communicating with the Navy Fleet Logistics Center. They were stationed at Guantanamo Bay to make sure that uh, we can keep some type of sustainment down there for the FRCs that are running in and out. Uh, there are times where they can come in there and try to wipe out food in the commissary, so we're trying to do what we can to make sure that there's food there. So when they come in and pull out, for those that are operating down at the uh, southeastern watch section down there, then they got the food down there. Here, uh, we've continued to optimize PRs. Uh, we're the, another great thing uh, Mr. Wernicke did. He made sure that everything was set up so that Chief Sukhoi could come in and just start obligating and get uh, PRs uh, punched out for all these shore units out there that needed like equipment. It's just, it's been way beyond this age. Uh, and then uh, my boss, Mr. Winston here, uh, we've been on the calls, we're working with uh, 1113 and then one well before galley manpower requirements analysis, and that's basically to enhance the galley staffing. Um, we see where the galleys are, these are the numbers, but now we're looking at like this station, they don't really need four CSs here. Or you have this, this larger base set, you know what, they probably should be plus up three. So we're looking at this type of analysis here to try to make sure that we're able to have the capabilities uh, to, 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 to just provide better support for the customer base. Quick interject there, this is another example where CS is lead the red way. No other rating, had background information that they could share with the 1B4 folks to say, we can prove that this is how much work our folks are doing in the field. This is the math that has to be done. What that what that realized was 66 new positions of full of ashore just by adjusting the math because no one had taken a look at that before. And they said, how do you know you did it? And I said, we got seven years of data that shows exactly what it takes to put the meals out in ashore locations. They went, okay, literally. Two guys that have PhDs in, in organizational management, so you got good data, you're way ahead of everybody else, including the HSs who are still fumbling around trying to figure out what kind of medical support they need to clinic. So another another step forward. Every time we turn around, CS is the reason why. This this bottom bullet here, um, our cutters out there, I know they're aging cutters and here we are waiting for new cutters. I mean these cutters are near beat up, they're broken, and you're seeing it. Commands are not really spending that funding trying to like enhance these dining facilities it's like what's more important the rhi inflatable or do we you know what i mean do we get a new rhi or do we invest in a galley and we're seeing that some of these dining facilities are just a bad just a bad condition i think uh 
or see she she attested that that she was down there a couple weeks ago and so on. So we try to work with them and a lot of the problems is it's just like not being communicated from the FSO to the EPU or XPO and then going to the system to make sure that the disc reps or the CAS reps are put in correctly. So we are the advocacy here for uh, SFLC to make sure that they can do what they need to do in the proper channels to get in the, the funding that they need. Next slide please. I want to say one more thing about that last floor. This is important. As senior leaders, if you run into anybody in the fleet ashore that's getting the Heisman from an engineering team out of the house saying, yep, we're just going to keep repairing it, or hey, we're, it's not important enough for put on a CAS rep or a disc rep, we need to know, right? We can be the velvet hammer that massages that thing through SFLC if it's afloat, and we can talk to the silk folks, or more importantly, go to Dahl if necessary make sure the pressure is applied to get the money to fix the problem. There's absolutely no reason for people to be working in the dark ages, boiling water out back, doing other ridiculous things, putting in a fan in a freaking dog wooden door, okay, watertight door, to ventilate a space on a cutter. We've actually seen that, okay? There's no reason for RCSs to be working in suboptimal conditions, especially if they're just sitting in port. This stuff needs to get fixed. So let us know, let people know to reach out to us, and we will help get it fixed. I don't know that we have a 100% rate. I think uh, he's, he's stepped out, but I know that we can literally walk downstairs, stand in front of an LT or a product line manager saying, why do we have this problem? And we will start sweating them from that side as well. They are fully funded to fix galleys on cutters. One of the other things too with that is surveys. I know it's, um, it, it's we're supposed to do surveys every time that equipment fails and not everybody does it because there's a little bit of a paperwork hassle, but every time one of those surveys comes in, I, I ping the product line on it when I approve them, then they start seeing that trend. Oh look, every FRC compressor is dying. Then they, then they go see why and how we can move forward and fix that problem. Yeah, just a contact slide, this last slide, and I'm done here. Uh, the, the three things here is uh, for Sear Chief McPherson, in order to contact him, you would be using the USCG.mil, you'd be using the DLA.mil. If you can't reach him, it's CNC Jason Esther, who's his uh, alternate. And then uh, here's our SPO at USCG.mil. If you send anything in there or direct any any of the junior folks in there, any one of us to answer it because we'll get a, a pop-up notification for it. And other than that, that concludes our uh, subsistence so card fund brief. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Thanks. So we're going uh, to take a break from now till uh, 0930.